Good day from New York. My name is Dr. Leon Perman. I'm head of the Digital Financial Services Observatory in uh, New York. We're part of the Columbia Institute of Teleinformation at Columbia Business School in New York City. And I want to welcome you to uh, one of our uh, webinar series. And today we're going to talk about digital credit. Is it a silver bullet? It's presented by Graham Wright of Microsave. Before we begin, some housekeeping notes and information. Uh, so please keep your microphone off and video through, uh, throughout the webinar. Um, if you could please do not questions, ask questions by audio at any time, so that disturbs the presenter. Uh, and please do think about sending questions uh, to the webinar host, because we will ha have a uh, question and answer session straight afterwards at, at about 15 minutes to the hour. Um, and questions for the presenter will be asked after the presentation. So the agenda today, a uh, quick introduction to the observatory and to Graham Wright of Microsoft. Uh, then the webinar will be about 40 to 45 minutes. Um, and then we're going to do two, two quick polls. And just a heads up, one of them is to ask you how many people are sitting with you, uh, if it's more than you, just in a room because uh, we've been uh, notified that there are many more people uh, watching the webinars that register, so which, which is great. Um, and uh, we'd just like to see how many people are actually viewing our webinars. Uh, then we'll do the 10, 15 minutes Q&A, then a short wrap up, and then there's a post-webinar optional quiz, which we'll get to. You know you can earn a certificate under certain conditions, and we'll talk about that shortly. So a bit about the observatory, it's been around uh, since the beginning of last year, funded by the Gates Foundation. Uh, you can look at our legal database at uh, dfsobservatory.com, as well as an archive of all our other webinars uh, in the series since the, uh, the start, start earlier this year, as well as a recording of our conferences and uh, roundtable, which we had on, uh, on Monday and the risk. Uh, this is the team that produces the webinar. Um, Professor Ellie Noam is the director, me, Leon Perlman, Michael Weschler, who's the technical guru behind the, uh, the webinars, Jason Buckwright, executive director, CITI, and Nora Wurung, who is a staff associate at uh, DFSO, as well as Claire Lee. Uh, a bit about our activities, uh, I'll quickly run through this. We do the legal and regulatory database for producing model laws and regulations, annual summit, roundtables, webinars, publications and commentaries, and close collaboration with industry regulators, academics, donors, SSPs around the world. We present and do capacity building um, lots around the world. Uh, one more webinar which is coming up, which is on infrastructure security in uh, digital financial services, which I'm presenting on uh, December 13th at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, EST or 2, 2 p.m. GMT UTC. And again, about the webinar, if you attend six webinars and get 60% each for the post-webinar live quiz, uh, you can earn the webinar. So you have to do the, the uh, quiz at the same time as you watch the at the same time as you watch the the, the webinar, in other words, um, it won't be available uh, afterwards. It's, there's a two-hour window uh, to complete the the quiz. So just on the on the quiz itself, um, the quiz questions are based on what you see on the on the slides, not necessarily on what the presenter says. So if you want to pass the quiz, please pay close attention to what's actually on the slides themselves. Okay, a bit about um, Graham Wright. Uh, he's a good friend of the uh, the observatory. He founded Microsave and is currently its group managing director. And as he says, he's a reformed chartered accountant. Uh, he's provided training and technical assistance to a variety of financial institutions in Bangladesh, India, Indonesia, and Philippines, and throughout Africa. And I say, it, Graham uh, is, a, is a legend in financial inclusion and DFS. Um, he's been involved in it from the days, from the early days. He sat on the steering committee for M-Pesa and supported its initial pilot testing process, partnered with Equity Bank on its DFS strategy and operations. So I'm now going to hand over to Graham Wright, 
uh, to present on is digital credit a silver bullet? Graham, over to you. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, present uh, at the uh, DFSO. Um, these seminars, are, uh, webinars are really outstanding and a great contribution to the industry as a whole. So it's a privilege um, to, to be here and uh, to participate. Um, so a little bit of uh, ruthless self-promotion uh, here, first of all, just to tell you a little bit about Microsave. Um, we're an organization that started, as Dion said, originally in, um, in, in the days when really financial inclusion was about microfinance. And I held from the very beginning that the poor people couldn't possibly be expected to run the marathon out of poverty on one leg, just credit, and hence the name Microsave. And we worked um, from the very beginning to really understand the needs, uh, 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 perceptions, um, aspirations, and beh behavior of the poor in order to tailor financial services for them. Um, and Microsave now has about 200 staff, operates in about 50 countries around the world, um, and, and works primarily actually now on digital finance um, in one form or other um, across the globe. So let's talk digital credit. Um, it has become uh, a, 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 almost a holy grail, the way it's been talked up in many ways. and. Um, this is not, with, not without reason. Um, uh, this graph shows you over the years since 2007 uh, how um, Lending Club, which is a, a digital credit provider in the US, has um, consistently begun to move away from the standard FICO um, uh, credit scoring systems. Um, and the correlation has dropped to uh, 37%, which means that Lending Club is using a whole variety of additional data um, to make lending decisions and, in fact, therefore, to lend to many more people that banks using the traditional FICO approach would simply not take a risk on. So that graph for me, which is taken from a, a report by the Reserve Bank of Philadelphia, really highlights the full potential of digital credit. The question is whether we are beginning to um, achieve that real potential in the context of developing world where poor people typically have much lighter digital footprints than their counterparts um, in the US. So let's have a look at uh, what's been going on in Kenya, which is home to the original uh, consumer digital credit system um, M-Shwari, which was obviously launched by Safaricom in collaboration with Commercial Bank of Africa um, back in 2012. If we look in Kenya um, uh, at how people are using uh, digital credit, um, you can see that the vast majority of it is uh, either for household needs or emergencies or you know, personal attire and travel, um, household goods, and so on. So there's really, amongst the poor elements, there is really remarkably little use of it um, as working capital um, and uh, agricultural inputs, um, which is, of course, the uses that are most commonly trumpeted um, uh, in the um, in in the uh, literature surrounding um, digital credit. I find it very interesting. Um, there was a there was a, a post from um, one of the one of the senior officials in the in the Central Bank of Kenya talking about how they had analyzed the timings of the disbursement of digital credit and concluded that a very substantial proportion of it was being used by day traders um, to finance the um, the you know inventory at the beginning of the day uh, this was then sold and um, and and then they were in a position to repay um, the loans um, at the end of the day. I will return to that because I think it has very significant implications um, in in due course. 
but I think the key takeaway from the slide um, is, is that that 19% is also a tremendously important use um, because it means that it is being used for things like hospitals and doctors, uh, when kids are dropping out of school for want of education, um, you know, fees that need to be paid and so on. So again, let's not lose sight of the fact that digital credit is performing a really important role. And even under the ordinary household needs, we know that poor people very often face short-term shortages which they need to bridge, what, what are typically referred to as consumption smoothing needs. And again, I think digital credit plays a very important role in this. And when we look at what, um, what, what digital credit is displacing, perhaps unsurprisingly, it is substituting for um, shop credit, which again, you know, talks to consumption uh, smoothing, um, loans from family and friends, um, uh, which um, typically uh, the, the desire to um, replace family and friends is one of, of privacy. Um, uh, not wanting to go, you know, cap in hands to family and friends and have to explain why a loan is needed and so on and so on. Um, and also loans from shopkeepers and, and money, money lenders. So one of the arguments that I hear quite often advanced uh, to, in, in favor of digital credit is that it is um, uh, cheaper than uh, money uh, lenders, which may or may not be the case um, in in Kenya, as as you know, it's 7.5 percent a month. Um, in Uganda, it's uh, 10 percent a month um, from the, amongst the major providers. But you will find many other providers that charge a lot more, and one or two that charge marginally less. Let's return to those day, market day traders. Um, the, the data that we uh, sourced from one of the credit reference bureaus highlights how um, people repay um, in, you know, in what time period. And 36% of these month-long loans are, um, are paid within the first week. And 52% of them were paid within the first three weeks. But people incur that monthly interest rate irrespective of that in, from most providers. So we have a situation where the effective interest rate climbs enormously. And I have to ask myself, if really so many of these loans are borrowed for short, very short-term needs, why is it that the providers can't tailor the products um, to better reflect that need and perhaps, you know, introduce some form of overdraft, for example, that would allow people to repay quicker and thus incur um, lower interest rates? The other key point, of course, is that a very substantial proportion of them are paid after the due date, so after one month. Um, in fact, 48% of them uh, uh, sorry, not, not as many as 48 uh, percent, apologies, um, around about 40 uh, percent uh, of them are, are repaid after the, the due date. And this sort of um, behavior reflects the three persona that we, we came across as we did the qualitative research around this to understand people's um, needs, uh, attitudes, perceptions, and behaviors around these digital credit. So the, the borrowers that all the providers want are the repayers, the ones that take loans and repay them on time every time. Um, and these, these repayers sometimes use them for business, but very often uh, they're using them to respond to emergencies or, or consumption needs. Um, the jugglers are more, uh, more dangerous, a higher risk profile. These are people that take a loan um, from a variety of providers and often use one loan to pay off another. And what we find there is that digital credit is always last on the list to repay 
because it is typically a faceless loan. Um, there's no human interaction, so people don't really feel obligated to repay it in the same way as they do um, when they take a loan from uh, a savings and credit cooperative or um, a bank or an MFI where they feel that that institution might come chasing them um, in person. And then finally, there's a set of defaulters um, who are um, sometimes defaulting uh, for want of uh, you know, ability to repay, but in the majority of cases are defaulting because either they don't understand um, uh, the implications of not repaying um, or um, they, they took the loan on a whim. And there's a very substantial proportion of people who are responding to the uh, push marketing that comes with uh, a lot of these digital credit providers. So uh, a typical SMS would read, it's January after Christmas, you don't have much money, why not borrow from, and then be telling you how much you can borrow basis the algorithm that uh, the digital credit provider has uh, in place. So we see a lot of people taking these loans just to experiment, just to see what happens. And they are quite commonly uh, don't repay. So what does it look like in Kenya overall? Well, there are over 5 million users of digital credit in Kenya now. The average loan size is about $35, um, but that is distorted by equity bank because equity banks' average low size is well over double that, um, uh, because equity bank is lending not so much on the basis of um, you know, mobile, uh, mobile phone records, but also on transaction data in their core banking system. So they're able to um, uh, reduce risk by using the transaction data that they have and thus make larger loans and one suspects and indeed hopes um, suffer a much lower default rate. As I said earlier, the APR varies significantly between about 50 and uh, 600 percent. Um, and, uh, uh, but the, the, most com the most commonly used uh, providers in Kenya um, uh, offer loans around about 7.5% uh, a month. Um, the most commonly cited uh, loan uses, I think we covered this a little bit um, in an earlier um, graph, but this one suggests rather more um, use of um, loans for uh, working capital and agricultural inputs. Um, but, but the principle remains the same. There's a, a pretty small number that use it, really use it for working capital, but there's a lot that, that use it for consumption smoothing and emergencies, which are, as I say, very important, um, uh, important uses that we shouldn't underestimate. So um, when we look at the negative listing, there are about 2.6 million people now negatively listed on the Credit Reference Bureau. Um, that's about 10% of the adult population of Kenya. Um, there are fewer positively listed, but that's really because positive listing only really be, um, became a norm in July 2016. Um, so, yeah, um, that's, uh, that's understating the number of uh, positive listings, I think it's fair to say. Of the negative listed ones, um, 1.7 million of them still have uh, a balance outstanding, um, and just under a million, 900,000 of them have have paid off their loans. Um, but of course, their negative listing remains um, for five years. Now, this has really big implications um, because negative listing means that. Um, in order to borrow from a bank or any other institution that um, asks uh, for it, um, uh, you need to produce um, a certificate um, from the Credit Reference Bureau saying that you've cleared your debt. And that costs um, uh, 200 and 
2,200 Kenya shillings, about $22. Um, so given that, um, if we uh, look at the numbers, um, about 900,000 people are negatively listed for loans of less than $10, and about one and a half million are listed um, for loans less than $50. The prospect of paying an additional $22 to, uh, you know, get off that negative listing um, once you've repaid is perhaps, um, you know, uh, a struggle. And so we shouldn't be surprised that um, so many people, um, you know, elect not to do that. The other thing that I think is worth mentioning, um, and I haven't got the graph here um, because it's very sensitive, is the numbers of uh, loans that wind up being negatively listed. So what we did with the TransUnion data was looked at the percentage of first-time loans that would wind up being negatively listed, and it was 32%. 16% of second-time loans would be negatively listed, 12% of third times loans would be negatively listed, and 9% of fourth time loans would be negatively listed. So it's only by about the fifth loan cycle that that negative listing settles at around 5%. And this is why, first of all, there's very significant premium price, risk premium pricing going into these um, these digital credit loans, which is which is exactly why the uh, interest rates are so high, um, but also it means that the credit providers um, struggle to to resell that debt um, until it gets to um, the the fifth loan cycle or so, because the risk profile is so extraordinarily high. So what should we, you know, how should we respond to this? Um, so uh, some suggestions for Credit Reference Bureau and policymakers. Um, uh, so the first thing is um, there is alleged to be quite significant variation between the three credit, the data held at the three Credit Reference Bureau in Kenya. And um, I, I think we should be looking for systems that um, use um, uh, technology to auto submit uh, listings, um, both positive and negative, to the Credit Reference Bureau. So there's consistency of data. Um, and then the Credit Reference Bureau needs to be able to differentiate themselves by offering much more nuanced analysis and thus credit ratings um, uh, to allow providers to make uh, better decisions. Because clearly someone who has defaulted for a, you know, a few days for a very small loan is a very different type of uh, risk profile than someone who has defaulted for uh, six months on a $500, $600 loan. So um, that, that is something that I think needs significant refinement. At the moment, it's, it's a very blunt instrument. Also, at the moment, there are no mechanisms for customers to check and correct their credit history, and that needs to, to change. Um, and we also need to see um, improved uh, guidance and then enforcement of that guidance on the need for providers to declare terms and conditions, because when we did the qualitative research, a lot of people simply do not understand the terms and conditions of these loans that they're taking. Um, and in fact, CGAP has done some very nice work uh, demonstrating that actually if providers do uh, go out of their way to clarify terms and conditions, it increases trust um, and uh, repayment rates as well. I think um, we should look at probably uh, banning or significantly limiting the push marketing over SMS and possibly also the Facebooks and, and so on that are used by the um, uh, the uh, digital credit providers like Tyler and Branch that d d deliver over smartphones. Um, and then finally, I, I think it's important to mandate, insist that offshore app lenders like Tyler, Branch, and so on um, report to the Credit Reference Bureau. Many do, but not all do. And um, I think it's important that that is in, uh, in place. 
In terms of the providers, I mean, obviously we talked about clarity on terms and conditions. That makes business sense for them to do, do so. And as I alluded to earlier, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to refine the program to um, first of all create overdrafts that, that reflect uh, people's needs and uses of these loans for the short-term emergencies and the, and the day trading and so on, but also as uh, people demonstrate a good credit history, not only should they be offered higher amounts, but and they will also need longer re repayment terms, so more than a month, and interest rates really ought to decline to reflect that that good credit history because the risk is um, is declining. At the moment, good pay, good repayers are simply carrying the risk premium of those uh, many many defaulters that um, are driven really as much by the provider's own systems as um, a propensity to default. And then finally, certainly for larger loans, but probably for even medium-sized loans, we need to be looking for more human touch. This is a recurring theme that is, um, that is coming out, and um, it's quite clear that, that agents will have an important role to play um, in this. If we go to Uganda, we can see some of this beginning to emerge in um, the new Airtel uh, Wewelo uh, product, um, which is uh, delivered in, in conjunction with Jumo. So, I mean, first of all, interesting, um, if you look at the top of the slide, uh, the loans are being offered not just to customers, but also to agents, something that uh, will help agents manage their liquidity and something that Microsave and uh, the Helix Institute have been pushing for a long time. You will see in the um, in the the uh, five orange boxes that there are some really important changes um, that this product uh, has made to the sort of plain vanilla um, Mshwari or Mocash product. The first is that service fees, which is interest, of course, um, vary based on the loan term and the risk profile of the individual. So no longer are um, people carrying the, the, the risk for um, the non-payers, um, but also they can, they can tailor the loan according to their real needs. And, and to do that, of course, they need to create those risk profiles and they, they're doing so and um, are being you know, very conservative about that um, in order to, um, to uh, you know, minimize um, the risk and, and the high repayment rates that they've got to date uh, have proved that that is indeed possible. Um, this is not linked to a CRB simply because uh, Uganda doesn't have a credit reference bureau that can manage this at this stage, but I hope that it will be in due course. But the two other, I think, very positive um, changes are, first of all, um, they are going out of their way to communicate, even on feature phones, the top five um, critical terms and conditions, and also customers are being given the opportunity to choose their loan term based on needs. So I think this is an important step forward. I hope it will be the, the first of many because there are many, many opportunities to significantly improve the structure and pricing um, of digital credit um, in this format. But I think it's worth going to India to look at other formats of digital credit. Um, and this allows us to look at, A, a completely different model, but also um, a, an environment or a use case that is much stronger, um, namely uh, SME lending. Um, so. In India, um, there's a company called Neogrowth, and this is by no means a unique example. It's um, increasingly common across the world, which is using um, the digital transactions made at merchants in order to create a profile and extend digital credit to those merchants. Now, in the case of Neogrowth, 57% of those merchants didn't have a credit history before. 
and they're using the the um, debit card and credit card sales um, on the point of sale devices at those merchants to assess and build a credit score for those merchants. <coughs> um, and also it is um, then in common with uh, the likes of Copa Copo and others um, deducting repayments um, basis uh, sales made on on um, on the cards and this this creates a uh, repayment schedule that reflects the level of business that is going through the shop. Um, and that uh, uh, makes it much easier for the merchant and much less stressful because you're not having to come up with money um, when there have been very poor sales and he's not, or he or she is not um, being penalized when he or she repay um, in advance of the, the, the um, time due. So impact of that has been really positive. They've, they've uh, lent over $120 million uh, to more than 6,500 uh, 6, SMEs um, in one year alone. And um, as a consequence, you can see that um, merchants' business has grown. They've got an improved credit score as they build their, their profile through the system. Um, and indeed, a quarter of them are now even getting um, funds from the formal sector. So that I think this is a really good example of how where a, a user has a really decent um, digital footprint, um, digital credit can be a lot more fine, refined uh, instrument and a much more effective one than we're seeing with the sort of consumer credit um, that, is, that is so common um, across Africa nowadays. So you can see that um, from the point of view of, of uh, neo growth, um, what you've got uh, for, for benefits for the organization is the, the automatic collection of um, repayments, loan decisions that um, are, are again automated, but um, basis the non-traditional digital data that everyone talks about, but in this case really exists. Um, because I would question whether a typical uh, market lady sitting at the side of the road with a feature phone um, and buying, you know, scratch cards of 50 cents twice a month really leaves a, a credible digital footprint on which to make a, a, a credit decision. What I think we're seeing in East Africa with these consumer digital loans is a credit history based uh, approach to lending. So you lend the, the borrower a small amount to start with, see whether they repay. If they do, then you lend, lend them a bit bigger amount. And if they, they repay that, a bit bigger amount again. That's for all the hype, there are about 10,000 data points and so on and so on. That to me is just traditional um, credit history lending. I suspect the 10,000 data points have a very, very low weighting in the overall algorithm by comparison to whether they repaid the first, second, third, and so on loans. But for SME, uh, MSMEs, um, you have a, a, you know, the ability to develop credit history um, uh, using these digital payments um, and build a, a significant profile um, and one that eventually allows these um, these borrowers to go to formal sector. What happens if we want to lend to um, uh, the mass market in India? Well, um, that India is coming at this in a very different way. It's not using um, the same approach that we're seeing in Africa because what it is doing is basing everything on uh, the Adar biometric identity. So that is the foundation, literally translated, of the whole digital uh, ecosystem that India is, is currently building. On top of that, the government has ensured that every household um, has a, uh, a bank account. Um, along with that, many of them have uh, debit cards. Um, 
and also the opportunity to buy life and accident insurance and theoretically though less practically an overdraft facility. Through those bank accounts and using the Aadhaar system then the Indian government is pushing a growing proportion of its G2P payments um, and uh, also is um, working with the National uh, Payments Corporation of India to build a variety of um, payment systems that will allow not just smartphones but also feature phones to relatively easily uh, make and receive payments. So this means that uh, uh, the vast array of merchants um, that uh, stretch across India can effectively use their mobile phones as point of sale devices and um, what the Indian government is doing um, is pushing more and more people to use uh, digital rather than cash payments. And that's important because the idea is to create um, a digital footprint in the, what's called the digi locker, which is a, um, uh, a place where um, not just the transaction information, um, but also education records, land records, um, uh, and where I've, if I'm a farmer, as I'll talk about later, you know, records related to fertilizer, seeds, and pesticides, all are stored. So in that digi locker is a, 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 all the records that I can accumulate on my digital history. And I, as a user, can choose when to open that up to other third parties. So this has the opportunity of democratizing credit in that instead of having to go in supplication from bank to bank begging for a loan, people with a, a well-populated digi locker can open the digi locker to a variety of banks at the same time, tell them what term they want the loan over, and ask them for the terms and conditions that they would offer. So that way, I essentially create a marketplace um, for my uh, loan. I say I need a 10,000 rupee loan. I'm going to want it for six months. Uh, which of you banks can give me the best offer? This inverts the relationship between the, the customer and the bank, and uh, we'll, it will be very interesting to see how that pans out. So let's have a look at how this is all being used. Um, so <clears throat> that ecosystem um, is often referred to as the India stack. And um, here are two examples. One is um, on the left-hand side, uh, Echo and Capital Float are lending to merchants. Uh, whereas Savita and Axis Bank are, are lending against remittance history. Um, but what is uh, interesting is this, the remarkably low costs that they are able to do this at. Now, this cost, of course, does not include default, um, but defaults are at this stage at least much, much lower because the digital footprint from merchants and um, you know, migrants who've been remitting back to their village for years and years um, is much deeper than uh, some of the digital footprints that are being used to lend against in East Africa. But you can see that if all layers of the stack are activated, um, the cost of including acquisition of, um, of making that loans drops to less than half a dollar, which is, you know, phenomenal. Ultimately, if we get the if India gets the Digi Locker working well, um, what we can do is start lending to um, a wide range of rural people, and um, this includes farmers, which, uh, as many of us know, are, are some of the most difficult people to lend to, um, uh, and some of the most vulnerable uh, uh, people. And the reason that we'll be able to do this is because um, the DigiLocker will capture all the inputs that the farmer makes. Um, so 
the, the seeds he buys, the chemicals and the fertilizer and the pesticide and so on that he buys, um, all will be recorded by the digital DigiLocker. In addition, um, the soil health card, which is a, uh, uh, an assessment of the quality of the soil, which allows um, the, uh, the farmer to understand what pesticides, uh, sorry, what fertilizer needs to be put on that uh, land and soil, um, will also be there, as will the land holding itself. So I will have a comprehensive picture of what uh, what acreage, what quality soil, what seeds, what pe uh, fertilizers, what pesticides, and so on um, uh, have gone into that land. I will also have um, history of the um, sales and revenue received um, from previous harvests. And <laughs> I will also be able to look at whether the farmer um, has used any of the futures and hedging systems that are available in, in India. So all that information together will provide a huge range of inputs um, that will enhance um, credit scoring. Um, and we could further uh, strengthen that with, um, you know, digi digital um, education on agriculture, um, digital support services so that when pesticides need to be applied, the farmer is alerted and so on and so on, um, and track whether that farmer responds to those and again build that into the DigiLocker and thus the potential credit score. So I can see that um, once it is up and running and populated, the uh, India um, digital ecosystem really has significant potential to allow financial institutions to make informed uh, lending decisions um, to some of the more difficult to reach um, uh, borrowers um, in, in the country. And furthermore, as I said uh, earlier, the power will be inverted in that it will be the farmer offering to borrow from the bank rather than the banks, um, you know, rather than the farmer having to go in supplication to the banks to beg for a loan. So I think there are really exciting times ahead. There's huge potential, um, but at the moment, we need to pay attention on how to improve the quality of digital credit, um, particularly consumer digital credit, as is currently being practiced in, in Africa. There's great scope for, an improve, for improvement, and um, I hope that both regulators, policymakers, and particularly providers um, will, will support that move, and um, we can begin to reverse some of the negative effects that uh, consumer digital credit has had in East Africa. With that, I will... Um, open to questions. I'm very grateful for all of you who've joined the, the webinar um, and uh, look forward to fielding your questions. Yeah. Thank you, Graham, for that. There was uh, um, super interesting. I think you covered a lot of ground and we've got a lot of questions which have uh, which has come through on that. Um, and before we before we do that, um, I want to just uh, uh, we're gonna yeah send send questions through now, please. Um, we're gonna hold two polls and just a bit of a um, outreach as well. Um, just a request to you for laws and regulations if you uh, if you have access to them to populate our database. Any laws, regulations, circulars, directors from your country for our, our database. Uh, and in fact, and if you have any policy related papers you've written that you'd like us to look at for potential publication on our website, we'd be happy to uh, look at that. We're also working on some papers on cybersecurity. So if you have any information on cybersecurity breaches in your country on payments, for example, um, and any USSD related. Um, uh, uh, or DFS cybersecurity regulations, as well as any MOUs between central banks and, and telco regulators. 
So you would really help us if you had that information. Just email it to info at dfsobservatory.com. Um, again, we're gonna we're gonna um, have the post webinar quiz straight after this. And before we do that, we're going to uh, run two polls. Again, if you're in a in a group of people um, that uh, if you could step away from the group to the computer and answer the poll questions, we'd Super appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, so Michael, our technical uh, whiz, will be loading the polls in a second, and there you go. It's on, on the right-hand side of your screen. So you've got uh, about 45 seconds to a minute to answer them. Again, if you're in a group, you step away to the computer and answer the, uh, the questions. Thank you. Again, while we're doing that, please send questions through to the host. Fifteen seconds. Okay, we notice a few more people are still answering polls, so we give it another five, ten seconds. Okay. Okay. Polling's ended. Thank you very much for your assistance. Uh, Graham, some questions have come through. Uh, if I could pronounce this correct, Zitina Mustafa asks, uh, how different is marketing communication for digital credit different from financial service provider marketing and communication? Graham? So, Graham, I don't know if, you, if you're uh, no, no, live no. Okay, great. Okay, now we can hear you. Um, that's a very good question. And um, I think the, the answer is that um, because so much of digital credit is pushed through mobile phones, the advertisements or, or, or the marketing comes direct to you um, in your pocket, for want of a better description, and furthermore will be tailored for you. Um, and I think that will become increasingly the case, you know, as we as we see um, AI take you know take a, a bigger role. Um, but but um, we've also seen. I mean, there was an article um, from a, the Federal Reserve uh, of, of Philadelphia only recently uh, highlighting that more vulnerable people are targeted by digital lenders in the U.S. Um, and this is a point that's also made in O'Neill's excellent book, uh, Weapons of Math Destruction. And um, I, I don't think we should be surprised, but what, um, what it means is that access to your mobile phone number means that, you know, if you fall into a profile that, that lenders think is more likely to take a loan, they can target you direct, they can tell you how much you're, you, loan you can take, which, you know, is a big hook, um, and they can encourage you to, to, to do so. And certainly a very substantial proportion of the, the people that we interviewed um, had taken a loan um, out of curiosity, which is probably not a very good reason for taking a loan. Okay. Thank you, Graham. Uh, question on... Uh on T's and C's uh, from Cass Culber. India, Kenya, Uganda together all have great language diversity. How is this being addressed in making terms of conditions known to loan recipients? Another great question. Um, and I, I think the answer to that is, um, I mean, it, at the moment it's primarily in English or uh, uh, Kiswahili in um, Kenya and uh, Tanzania. I actually don't know what's going on in, in Uganda. Um, and because we don't yet have the consumer digital credit in India, I don't think it's as big an issue yet, but most certainly will become one in due course. Uh, okay. Uh, one from Carl Frank. 
why would you want to ban SMS advertising? This seems anti-competitive. Um, I, I think because um, because of the reasons that I outlined um, in response to the first question, um, if we are winding up with so many people um, being pulled into um, taking loans that um, they don't really want or need um, as a function of SMS advertising, I don't think that's a, a desirable thing. And yes, in pure competi you know, competitive terms, that, that argument makes sense. I think we're talking about vulnerable uh, populations here, and I think we have to be very careful. Um, people are perfectly happy to ban advertising of cigarettes. I'm not sure that uh, digital loans are fundamentally different in many cases. Well, I suppose if you ban SMS advertising, there might be restrictions also on email advertising because it's a different, just a different bearer. Uh, and in that question, in that way, we've got a question from uh, Roshnia in Kathmandu. Uh, how involved do you think regulators should be in, involved in uh, credit? Um, which regulators? So uh, this is also a good question um, because I mean, the reason that the regulators haven't been as involved as I think they should have been to date is, of course, because the majority of these loans are very small, they don't represent a systemic risk. But boy, do they represent a reputational risk. And, you know, as I say, it's taken um, little over four years for... 10% of the adult population of Kenya to wind up negatively listed. That is not something that you want, um, uh, even you know, as a central banker. So I do think that central bankers will need to get involved in this. Uh, to date, they haven't, um, because they have sort of you know more pressing issues. But I mean, this is the old question about um, you know systemic risk is 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 defined by um, value of um, you know of financial services, but this is a volume issue. So while value might be driven by a relatively small number of large um, loans, this is a volume issue where you have a very large num uh, number of small loans. Okay, I'm going to run through the questions as quickly as I can because Graham will quite a few that uh, your, your webinar has generated. Um, Jatinda Handu in India, um, how long do you think it would take for digital credit to take off in India, especially with the India stat um, infrastructure e, -cons e consent in place? He says because many digital credit providers are actually very active as of now, but the digital locker service is not used by the target segments. Yeah, I mean, I think that's absolutely right, and, and this is the challenge. Um, the DigiLocker really is still under construction, um, so it will take some time, and in the interim, we will see um, some of the models that um, were highlighted in the slide that, where we were talking about capital float and uh, Suvida Access Bank and so on, where people are lending against transaction history um, uh, because they've got that transaction history outside the DigiLocker. But over time, I hope that we'll see the DigiLocker being populated and, um, you know, that will really depend on, on the success of the Indian government's drive um, to digitize transactions across India. Okay. Uh, Mushin Tirmizi. Uh, what is the correlation between emergency credit and digital credit? Are they positively correlated by research or repayment history? And I suppose that means uh, the, so the the nano credit that you get for uh, airtime, so telco one or two dollar um, loans, just to make certain calls in the emergency. So is there cor any correlation? I think you asked between that and digital credit in terms of repayment history and types of people that are using it. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but it's something that it's one of the things that we were thinking about in terms of um, helping digital credit providers assess uh, credit risk um, at a lower cost. Uh, what I mean by that is when I lend 
in airtime, um, that's not uh, as high a risk for a telco as lending real money. And what the majority of them are doing is jumping into lending real money straight away. It seems to me that you, they should almost be encouraging people to, to borrow airtime first in order to demonstrate willingness and capability to repay, even if just to get used to the process before moving to lending cash. And the reason I say that is because it should reduce the risk and thus over time the interest rates that are, that are sort of turbocharged by the risk premium. Okay, a uh, question from Susan in Nairobi um, on, on privacy. Um, essentially asked, if I can paraphrase the question, um, what does one do about scraping of exhaust data? Uh, what are the privacy implications of that if they're using that data to create a, a, a credit profile? Um, again, a really good question. That's one of the reasons that I like the India system in that it's my choice whether I open my digi locker or not. Um, but I'd also make a sort of another observation, which is that every time you and I use uh, Facebook, Google, Amazon, or anything, um, they're busy profiling us and scraping all the data and then on selling it without our permission um, to other users. And again, back to O'Neill's um, excellent book, Weapons of Math Destruction, the way that um, data is used um, is pretty egregious in many, many cases. It's, it's very, very often used to target uh, vulnerable um, people. Um, so for example, she gives the example of, of um, third grade universities targeting returning servicemen um, knowing full well that um, they'll be able to, they'll be easily able to get government uh, student loans um, for this very, very poor quality of education that won't lead them to much better job opportunities. So I think we, it's, it, it goes beyond just digital credit. It is a, um, a more pervasive and more worrying uh, concern, this, this whole privacy one. I, I, personally would, would um, dearly love to stop these big Silicon Valley corporations collecting data on me every time I move. But of course, they simply shut you out of the service if you try to do that. Yeah, I, I know that uh, some governments are addressing this in terms of, of linking um, privacy to, to credit. In fact, Mozambique, I'm told, is passing a uh, privacy legislation to even, in fact, address this exhaust uh, data issue and how it's used to provide information for um, uh, credit scoring. Um, in the minute or so that we've got remaining, uh, one more question, if you could, um, if you could answer this, Graham, uh, from Max: What is the future of digital credit in the context of poor regulation and increasing supply of credit that is um, causing over indebtedness and multiple borrowing? Another really good question. Um, so, I mean, I've had discussions with colleagues um, worrying about whether we're seeing the beginning of, a, of a, a consumer credit crisis that, you know, characterized um, South America, for example, um, uh, a decade and a half ago. Um, uh, and I do think that's a risk. The only mitigating factor is that the majority of these loans are terribly small. Um, and so what I, I, I suspect we'll see is um, just a, you know, an increasing proportion of people who are unable to borrow because they've got petty cash um, negative listings. Um, but whether it'll have a, a significant impact on the financial infrastructure, I'm inclined to doubt simply because the loans are so small and because the, the risk premiums built into the interest rates are so large. Great. Um, Graham, thank you so much for a superb presentation. In fact, I must say that next to our blockchain webinar, yours holds the uh, record for the most number of participants. 
So congratulations, obviously an important subject and you're a great presenter. So thank you very much for um, for uh, the, the insights from, from all those countries and the great work that Microsoft, Microsoft uh, continues to do. Um, with that, um, just want to tell you quickly in the seconds we have remaining about the next webinar on uh, infrastructure security and digital financial services. Uh, you can sign up now on our website, December 13th. And if you are doing the quiz, uh, the quiz link is instruction is in your email. Uh, it's in the middle of the invite. If you have any problems accessing info at dfsobservatory.com, you have two hours to complete it. The 10 multiple choice questions, and if you've been concentrating on Graham's excellent slides, you shouldn't have any problem with them whatsoever. But nonetheless, good luck with the quiz for those who are doing it, and thank you so much to Graham again and everybody for participating in yet another DFSO Observatory um, uh, webinar. So from New York, it's a goodbye from us, and wherever you are in the world, good evening, good afternoon, uh, good morning. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.